Coming up on Digital Music Trends 176 on the 26th of March 2014, Rhapsody stops using the Econest, the UK closes a loophole on digital download taxes, Pono closes in on the $5 million mark, music piracy on mobile devices, Shazam partners with Juno, Beats Music's first figures, Spotify's desktop client and much more. This week's show is brought to you by Omniphone, the leading B2B cloud music provider powering global music services including Sony Music Unlimited, Guvera, Rara and Sirius XM. Find out more on Omniphone.com and by MusicGraph, the world's first knowledge engine for music, available as a consumer app and as a graph API for developers. Check out MusicGraph.com or Developer.MusicGraph.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linali and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as a, a video and an audio show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcasting apps, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many more. And to get in touch with the show you can uh, tweet us on at Trends or email contact at digitalmusictrends.com. Uh, your feedback and word of mouth in circulating the show is essential so please do share the show, uh, tweet it and, and share it within your network if you enjoyed it this week and uh, this week we have a uh, another packed uh, show with some great guests uh, starting with uh, sitar telly a uh, partner at connect ventures so hi sitar and thanks for joining me how's it going it's going very well it's great to have you and so and then we have uh, uh, matthew ogle founder of this is my jam so hi matthew <coughs> i can't believe you haven't been on the show before so great to have you yeah likewise great to be here it's awesome, and uh, you know it. Uh, uh, I, I think we're going to start with a follow-up uh, from a story, a story that we talked about last week. Actually, uh, it, it wasn't long before another customer of the Aquinas decided to pull the plug uh, on their use of the service following the Spotify acquisition. So Rhapsody announced this week that they will no longer be using uh, the services of the Aquinas uh, uh, as a recommendation engine, and they also kind of hinted that they were never too too happy with the results they got from the Aquinas anyway. So kind of not too bothered about that, but and. Uh, uh, it's kind of interesting because, uh, uh, of course, uh, Rhapsody comes with Napster, so both Rhapsody and Napster are going to be uh, uh, pulling out of using the Aquinas services. I mean, I'm not surprised just because I, I would have thought that any direct competitor of Spotify would have, you know, decided not to use uh, the Aquinas anymore. Uh, but uh, do you feel like this really opens up the field to two other companies coming into into the fold and and uh, filling that space, or or will these companies try and develop their own tech solution ar around that? Uh, Matthew, what do you think? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I really think for companies that can afford it, um, I think, you know, uh, the Econest were absolutely the best in that game. You know, if anyone operating in that space, they were solving it best. Um, but I think there probably was still some truth to Rhapsody saying, you know, the solutions were never quite right because it really varies, especially if you have a service that's been around for a while that has a very particular set of use cases or users or styles of music. Um, it's very difficult to make a one-size-fits-all data solution yeah. um, in the music space. So, um, you know, if they're for companies that can afford it, I think developing more competency in that in-house, you know, is always a good thing. Yeah, I guess uh, it's kind of a, it's always a, a problem though uh, when we're talking about finances uh, 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 to decide whether you're going to devote a hu huge amount of resources in developing an in-tech house solution, like in-house uh, tech solution for, for this type of problem. Because we know how yeah. much energy is that, you know, the Equinest and similar companies have, have, have expanded in, into developing their tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, this is an area where I think it makes more sense for there to be an independent tech solution right. and for each company to build it in-house. Because I think it's, it's actually an extremely difficult thing to build. Like what Econest did was very, very mm. hard. Yeah. And so for each company to replicate that effort is to me, one, it's, it's a waste of effort and it's just unlikely that they're able to. I don't know that there's that many people around who want to work on this yeah. for music. I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, because it's quite deep technically. There's a lot of people, uh, there aren't that many people out there that want to work on it. And I don't think every company can. So I do think there's an opportunity for another company to come along. I don't know how big that opportunity is. Right. I mean, one of the things that I, I look at a lot, because I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm a, a VC, right? So I have to look in terms of what's the, 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 the total opportunity. Uh, and I don't know how much Econess was sold for. Was that, was that public or not? Uh, no, I think the rumors no. were around 100 million, but they're completely Right, which is, you know, it's a totally respectable uh, amount of money, especially for how much they raised. Yeah. But I, I don't think anyone should expect uh, to build a company in that space that's going to be worth a billion or yeah. so, right? So I think th there is an opportunity, and it's just <clears throat> a matter of, of having the right expectations. The issue with that is when, when, the, when you know, the, the total opportunity isn't that big, it, because it's an expensive type of company to build, I think yeah. it's unlikely that there is a, a, another company in the space. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, that, that's that's an interesting thing, right? Because uh, uh, I guess we're going to see other third-party providers come in, but the question is whether uh, the companies that want to use them are going to be trusting them enough to remain independent now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's not a problem that's going to go away, I think. Yeah, um, given they have been and, uh, already. <laughs> what, what wouldn't surprise me, and I'm sure some companies have already been doing this, is using a third party like the Echo Nest or something like that to essentially bootstrap that part of your business right. until you're at a size where um, you know, it's simply uh, you know, a good business decision to make sure that you control the future of that part of your, of your product, right? Sure. Sure, that makes complete sense, and uh, and so I think we're going to see a, a, f a few more developments uh, in this space uh, uh, from from the Aquinas, and also you know we're going to see what the what Spotify does with the company. We'll, mm. In theory, you know they they said they're going to keep everything uh, open as is now, but uh, who knows what's going to happen in the next sort of six to twelve months? So yeah, I have, I have a question about the acquisition though. Is it was Spotify's main? Maybe we don't know, but was Spotify's main reason for buying it because it powered Discovery or because it powered their radio? Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's. I mean, it's been seen as a consolidation move towards the IPO, but uh, mm. uh, I think I, I think a little bit of both uh, probably, and also uh, the fact that if the company was on the market and they were looking for buyers potentially, then maybe they were worried that a, a competitor would pick up the company if they were relying on that tech. So maybe there was a okay. little a little bit of both, uh, I guess, on that front. Okay. And uh, and uh, in the UK actually, because uh, we're both in, we're all, all three of us are in, in the UK, so we have to discuss this uh, little tidbit <laughs> of news: uh, the fact that uh, the UK Chancellor George Osborne presented uh, the government's budget last week, and one of the measures adopted uh, uh, is uh, the closure of a tax loophole that allowed uh, uh, digital services uh, uh, to provide uh, uh, downloads uh, for music apps and eBooks, uh, uh, but routed by other European countries that had a lower uh, sales tax. So, for example, there were a, a, a quite a few businesses based in Luxembourg. Uh, which only has a 3% sales tax. So uh, as of January of 2015, uh, all the digital stores operating in the UK will have to apply the full UK VAT, which is 20%, and this could raise the price of downloads by up to 17% for uh, those digital stores that had been applying the, uh, the VAT from Luxembourg or other uh, similar sort of tax havens uh, of, mm -hmm. of that kind. Uh, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that uh, as I... I was looking at this, uh, I actually found that uh, uh, Apple doesn't uh, uh, have this uh, uh, tax avoidance in a sense because they, they bank in Ireland and the rate there is 23% for VAT. So actually uh, all of iTunes products shouldn't mm. really be affected by this. Uh, uh, theoretically, uh, which is mm -hmm. you know is a big portion, I guess, of the market still right now, uh, but it could affect some other products uh, uh, from other companies, from <coughs> ebooks and videos. So I don't know. Do, do you think that this is uh, something that was overdue from the government? Is it too late for this to be implemented? Uh, and uh, you know, could it spark uh, if if it does increase prices uh, a return to of consumers going well? Actually, you know, I'm gonna go and see if I can get this uh, this stuff for free because they decided to raise prices of by you know almost twenty percent all of a sudden. Uh, 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 Sitar, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so one, I think it probably is overdue. I don't know why you would tax digital goods. Actually, it's not that they were taxing digital goods differently. It's that they're allowing companies to just avoid yeah. taxes, which uh, which I don't really understand why you, you would let that go on. I think as consumers, you just, it was a nice deal for a while. But yeah. the fact is, you know, it, it, it wasn't really competitive, I, I think, vis-a-vis uh, -vis other types of retailers. Yeah. And with regards to whether it'll get people to download more for free, no, I think like if you're willing to pay for something, you're already mm. in a different subset of humanity, right? You're willing to pay <laughs> for a digital product. Yeah. And if you're willing to pay, I mean, there are people that go to crazy efforts to not pay 99p. I, I don't know that the people that are willing to pay 99 cents for something are all of a sudden going to stop. You know, there is some elasticity of demand but I, I think it's 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 more you know once you've decided to pay yeah. there's there's less e elasticity there than than getting people to pay yeah 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 uh, Matt, do you agree with that do you think that this is not really going to affect uh, uh, people's perception of, of paying for for music or books or films yeah absolutely I, I still think the distinction is between I'm going to pay or not going to pay rather right. than any sensitivity to something like that and yeah I mean this is I'm with Sitar this this 
you know, this decision feels a bit arbitrary, but that's pretty much the definition of a loophole. And it, I think it's good they're closing it. Yeah. Um, if it were up to me, there are some other loopholes I'd work on too, yeah. <laughs> rather than, <laughs> rather yeah. than uh, stiffing consumers with 20, uh, 20 pence, <laughs> but it, it makes sense that they're doing it. So. I would love to know if there were some like backroom conversations around this in previous years, uh, which had to do with uh, labels you know, saying, well, you know, yeah. if, you, if you allow this loophole to happen, then we can get a bigger share of the 99p of, of the track, and then we're, gonna, we're not going to fight you as much on some other things. <laughs> <laughs> Conspiracy theory, the theories <laughs> there can ab abound, I think. And, uh, you know, actually, segueing from that, there was an interesting story uh, from uh, a record, uh, record uh, on, on piracy uh, this week, and it was all about uh, uh, mobile piracy. So, uh, the uh, uh, report was from Dawn uh, Chemielewski, I hope I did her surname uh, uh, justice, and uh, she posted a piece uh, quoting an MPD group study uh, that found that mobile applications have eclipsed the file sharing services, online storage sites, uh, and stream ripping software as the most widely used source of free music download. So that research estimates that 21 million people in the US uh, have uh, used peer-to-peer -peer sites such as IsoHunt to download music, and uh, uh, the app uh, Music Maniac, which the article states provides free access to all the tracks in the Billboard Top 10, has been downloaded more than 10 million times. So, and Google has not taken it down in spite of requests from uh, the uh, music industry. So, uh, it's it's an interesting space because there are a lot of YouTube ripping apps uh, that are available today, and. Uh, it's uh, interesting that they're not being taken down. Uh, uh, and there are also a lot of apps that allow you to download free MP3s, especially on Android devices. Apparently, there's an estimate of 250 apps that allow you to do that. So is this just a natural evolution of piracy? Or is, can, it, can it turn into a real uh, new problem as uh, you know, we move on to LTE uh, you know, nationwide here in the UK and in the US, and it becomes uh, easier than ever for uh, teenagers to swap and, and download files for free, which, which was like, you know, quite, quite a, a difficult a hassle, a difficult thing to do up to you know, maybe uh, 12 months ago. Uh, uh, Matt, from a tech, tech standpoint, or what are your thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, is it a new problem or will it be a growing problem? Yeah. You know, I, I think no. Um, it turns out the internet in your pocket is still the internet and will do the things that the internet has done for the last <laughs> 10, 15 years. Um, I mean, in terms of ease of use, I still think, you know, Napster 15 years ago was still a, a better piracy experience than anything that right. we're talking about even today. Um, and I also think that, um, you know, on, on mobile especially, we now have technologies and frameworks and practices in place for extracting small amounts of money from people that work way better on these than they ever did on the desktop. Yeah. Um, and we've also learned a lot of lessons as an industry, both tech and on the content side, about pr approaches that do work against piracy, approaches that don't. And so I'm just hoping that you know we can bring all of those learnings to bear on, on whatever happens next. Um, I do think the the Android distinction is an interesting one. Google's kind of in a tight spot because they've staked their their platforms, you know, differentiation yeah. on this openness and this lack of oversight and supervision. So it's, it doesn't surprise me if that's happening there. But to me, that almost seems unrelated to the larger trend of you know, if you do want free stuff and you have something that connects to the internet, there will always be a way to find it. Yeah. What I'm hoping is that this just encourages all the players to make it so easy and so awesome and so enjoyable to pay a little bit for this content that you know we solve the problem that way exactly and uh, uh, an interesting part of it is because it is the fact that the ifi reported the four percent slump uh, in uh, uh, you know recorded music revenues for 2013 uh, mm. compared to 2012 where we had a plus two percent so i'm just wondering whether uh, the fact that the industry feels as if it is in a recession again uh, whether that's gonna increase their efforts uh, towards the fight uh, with piracy, which uh, in a sense had the East a little bit because it felt like, you know, streaming services were getting ground and uh, it, it didn't feel as much of, of, of an urgent problem for them. But but if they do see that recorded revenues continue to decline, maybe mm -hmm. they're going to start turning, you know, paying a little bit more attention to piracy once again. And we're going to see uh, a few more uh, uh, measures being, being taken, a few more battles on the front. Uh, Sitar, do you think that's, that's possible? I Possible. I mean, I don't know. I have a pretty dismal view of the recorded music industry as an industry. I've met really lovely people that work within it. I just, uh, you know, it's like when they get together, it's like the opposite of Voltron. You know, they turn into this evil monster. And it just, uh, it, I don't know. It, it's so, so I, I don't think they're, 
to if recorded music revenues will go down. Uh, to me, that's just not a question. Yeah. And so I think they will continue to go down. And what I haven't seen the music industry do is is really try to wholeheartedly embrace that change and restructure itself. Yeah. Still. And I think until that happens, they'll continue to fight it because they're not structured mm -hmm. to I exist in 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 what is happening now and in what is going to happen for the next ten years. Yeah. And so people always fight the things that that try to kill them. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know, talking about change, uh, uh, one story that I wanted to just mention because uh, uh, we've been following it since uh, it really started. Uh, start, the first rumors started around it is uh, Neil Young's Pono. So uh, uh, the Pono has now or, or almost reached five million dollars. It might reach the five million dollar mark by the time the shows go. The show goes live uh, in a few hours uh, with still 20 days to go on the Kickstarter campaign and while I stick to my argument that 30 or even 40 or 50,000 users uh, uh, don't make an ecosystem or maybe a sustainable ecosystem in my opinion the, the momentum is undeniable it's getting a ton of press and uh, I think definitely getting some somewhere in the way of raising awareness uh, which was uh, really his his main ob objective raising awareness around audio quality so uh, Sitar as a VC uh, uh, I think we, we actually chat, have a chat about this in the last show. You know, w in the way that it's presented today, would you have backed uh, the Pono or would you have considered no. it? No. No. Uh, I mean, I, I I think it's it's interesting, but I think you know, it's it's look. There's one of the best things about right now is you can find using Kickstarter or, or a lot of other places, you can find the subset of of people that really really care about the things you care about and create a small sustainable business that way. Right. And I think that's what Pono is, right? It's finding the 50,000 or 100,000, even if it's half a million, uh, and I don't think it's half a million, but even if it is half a million, it's finding those people and get delivering them exactly the product that they want, or at least a very close you know, uh, approximation of the product that they want. Yeah. But that's not a business. Uh, I, I think it's, it's not a long-term business. It's just really satisfying a very specific need people have uh, and so, so uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's backable, and I don't even know that it does that much to, to raise awareness because the people it's targeting are the people who care about it. Right. And it's sort of, it's not going to, you know, get other people next to them to say, oh, I suddenly care about audio quality as well. Right. The people who care about it care about it, and it's a great way of finding them. And, and, and to me, that, that, that's what he's done. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, uh, did, uh, oh, where do you stand in the Pono uh, uh, debate? Uh, have, you, have you bought one or? <laughs> I haven't. I mean, as a as a Canadian, I can't think rationally about Neil Young. We can do no wrong. Uh, but, and I mean, I do. You know, Pono is solving a real problem. You know, as someone who recently reinvested in physical audio gear, and I'm by no means an audiophile. Um, I now have a setup where I get a beautiful digital in from my online collection, mostly high quality MP3s. Yeah. But I also have a nice CD player plugged into the exact same setup. And I mean, the, the quality gap between MP3 and CD is very visceral, very real. You don't need to be an expert to hear it. It's a real thing. Yeah. Um, something that kind of upset me about Pono is they kind of fell into the pseudoscience bucket of like, we're going to be eight times better quality than, than CD and diminishing returns set in really fast above, you know, it turns out the CD standard is pretty well modeled to how the human ear and brain function. Yeah. <laughs> um, so sort of sad to see it. It felt a bit like a monster cable ad, you know, looking at the <laughs> looking at the science behind it. So that that upset me a bit. But yeah, I'm a sitar. Like this is a product that should exist. I think there is an argument to be made for this. Um, you know, I think 20, 30 years down the road, it would be really sad if we were in a situation where we actually started losing high quality recordings, especially yeah. of previous recorded stuff, as a result of there being no alternatives on the market. Yeah. Um, you know, do I think Pono will uh, displace, uh, you know, uh, the iPhone as, as a mechanism for listening to music? There's just no way. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting to, to look at also the, uh, you were talking about the preservation as well as sound recordings, and uh, I actually attended a, a, a day uh, seminar, I guess, or, you know, a conference uh, on uh, on Friday uh, called Keeping Tracks, organized by the British uh, yeah. Library's Sound Archive. And that was really interesting because they were talking about uh, how they're going about trying to preserve uh, uh, sound recordings and, and, and making sure that at least the most uh, endangered recordings that they have in their archives are being uh, digitally uh, encoded. And uh, uh, one of the interesting things about that day was the fact that uh, they turned to independent labels to start this process. Uh, and uh, they said that they haven't had much response from 
majors in terms of trying to uh, uh, um, get some response in, in, in getting their back catalog or, or managing to preserve some of their collection that is not currently being uh, being monetized. So uh, yeah, again, you know, interesting stuff there. Uh, the British Library is working really hard on getting the recordings encoded in the highest bitrate possible if it comes from from tape. So uh, it could be a, a great uh, a great <laughs> showcase for the Pono. But uh, as of now, I don't think they have a lot of uh, 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 you know, popular content to play with uh, mm. because of the restrictions placed yeah. by copyright and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, an interesting game there. I, I, you know, I know that the Library of Congress is doing a lot of work at, uh, towards uh, with labels and trying to uh, at least get their archives. Uh, they can't really uh, be accessed from anywhere but the physically at the Library of Congress because of copyright issues. Mm. Uh, but at least they're trying to preserve the catalogs that they don't think labels are able or willing to uh, maintain properly and, and you know, uh, um, uh, keep at the right temperatures and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's an interesting debate around that and uh, I wonder what's going to happen in the next like 10 or 20 years as these tapes actually start degrading to the point that they're not uh, listenable anymore. Yeah, it's funny. It seems like for a few years now, there's always been this idea that just a few years out, something will happen in music tech that allows labels to really commercialize their back catalog more yeah. effectively. Yeah. Um, and I still believe there is an audience there, but I, I no longer suspect that, you know, there may not be, you know, through, through commercial incentives alone, we may not yes. be able to preserve all that. So I'm glad that cultural organizations and others are, are getting on the case too, because yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's important stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, independent labels, uh, Shazam continues its wave of partnerships, and this time an important one with uh, Juno Records, which uh, uh, will allow the company to add its catalog uh, uh, of uh, uh, music uh, to, to Shazam, essentially, uh, so that uh, it will be Shazamable. Uh, this includes 4 million digital tracks and over 110,000 vinyl releases. The interesting thing about the vinyl releases is that uh, those are also going to be included in the deal, so that uh, uh, releases that are not actually ever released on digital or that are not released on digital for several weeks uh, after the vinyl release uh, are going to be Shazamable, which uh, makes a difference for people that are going to clubs uh, and listening to, to new uh, tracks that have been dropped by DJs. So uh, uh, a big deal there, uh, you know, 4 million tracks is, is a lot. And uh, uh, of course, with uh, Ultra and Miami Music Week happening this week, that's definitely a good timing to announce, uh, announce the deal. Uh, but the th interesting thing for me is that Shazam has been, it feels like it's been trying to get away from music in a sense for, for the last mm. uh, couple of years and, and really highlighting their relationship with uh, uh, TV companies and you know their, their commercial capabilities for advertising, uh, but really it seems to always go back to music. You know they, they announced uh, the Warner deal where Warner is setting up a label that is uh, is going to be driven where artists discover is going to be driven by Shazam, and uh, uh, Shazam is going to actually have a share of revenues from that. And so it seems like Shazam always an, end up going back towards the music and uh, and with a valuation of half a billion dollars uh, now apparently it's uh, it's uh, an interesting space to be in. Uh, so Sitar, do you think that they are uh, sort of Toying, going back and forth with the, with the idea of music or non-music, music, no music, or is it just a natural evolution of the company? No, I mean, I think, you know, if, if well, I don't know uh, much about the internal works of Shazam, sure. but if I had to imagine, I think, you know, they have a very, very, very strong user base in, you know, people who use Shazam to figure out what track is playing right now. Yeah. That's the core of what they do, and that's been the core of what they do for a very, very long time. And while they've been trying to expand into other areas, if I were them, I'd still, you know, what's good is that they're not giving up product or, or marketing development partnerships in the core of their product, right? The exactly, worst thing they yeah. could have done is, is, is to let mm. the original Shazam product <clears throat> wither and 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 just go totally into into uh, TV, which is speculative at best right now. Yeah. Um, so I I, I I I I don't see them as going back and forth so much as as trying to to expand their product base while still making sure they're serving the the people who like to use their product uh, well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, Matt, Matt, from a, from your perspective, uh, you know, uh, is. Uh, is there a lot of room to grow for Shazam still as a company in the music space? Well, uh, there's definitely potential there. I mean, they, they're faced with the classic problem, but as Citra said, they also have a huge asset, which is they you know, started as a utility. Yeah. Um, and to this day, they still do an awesome job of satisfying that one use case that people, when you think of writing a song, you know, it's nearly a, a verb like Google, you yeah. Shazam it, right? <laughs> um, and... Um, you know, people, uh, myself included, have paid a lot of lip service over the last five years to music discovery and discovery services. And I mean, they're one of the few that can say they are 100% a discovery service. And I think, um, <laughs> you know, I know they've been talking for a while about 
Um, what can the follow on actions be after you've Shazam something? Does your history mean anything? Should it be more shareable? And I think if they can pursue some of those things right, as well as some of this other stuff they're, they're trying to do with TV, they might actually you know, do that magic trick well, which is starting as utility, still performing that, but then becoming a wider service over time. I think you know, they have as good a shot at pulling it off as anyone. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's one of the most interesting companies in the music space, and it's not talked about enough, uh, I think, uh, mm. uh, as we concentrate on actual service providers, but they, they're really enabling a lot of the discovery when it comes to to a live setting or you know being somewhere and just wanting to know what the track yeah, what the track is totally. all about. So uh, and it's, it's weird actually we're not hearing as much about Soundhound, so I wonder what's what's happening over there mm. in terms of uh, inner workings. But uh, yeah, definitely uh, Shazam seems to be stealing all the headlines in the last uh, few months at least. And uh, uh, moving on to Beats Music, Beats Music has uh, some interesting stats that came in from Bloomberg uh, this week. Uh, and the publication reports that the service, according to their sources, signed up around a thousand subscribers per day in the first month, month since launch. So that's around 28,000 customers, uh, although uh, it has gotten over 750,000 people, apparently, which seems like a huge number, uh, on the free trial via AT&T, uh, with the first conversion rates uh, of people that are ending the first one-month trials uh, being as high as 70%. So uh, a really great uh, uh, number there for Beats uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, AT&T side but uh, pretty poor figures when it comes to the individual signups from people that are not coming through the AT&T funnel so uh, uh, you know Matt do you, do you think that these are are subpar figures for a company that needs to scale to millions of users or is the whole play entirely based around uh, carrier uh, partnerships and in that case you know the actual sign up figures from users that are not coming through that shouldn't be a concern for the company Sure. Um, I think it's almost impossible to judge anything by you know the first month or even yeah. the first three months of figures. Um, I mean, if that conversion rate is real, and if it potentially stick, could stay even remotely close to that number um, outside of AT and T context, then that's pretty interesting. Because I mean, something that I honestly thought they'd do right out of the gate, and that I'm sure they're saving is you know, um, why they wouldn't offer a free trial with every pair of Beats headphones sold. Exactly. Um, you know, if they can turn on other, other things like that uh, and keep even, heck, even a 30%, 40% conversion, you know, uh, then they'd be in great shape. So um, <laughs> I think it's too soon to say. I think, um, especially in the U.S., I think um, paying for a streaming service is still new enough that things like trials and bundling are going to be super important for a while. Yeah. Um, so just the raw, like people walking uh, up off the street and subscribing numbers, those being a bit low, I'm not sure that matters yet. Um, uh, and yeah, too soon to say, but I think um, there's some promise there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sitara, did you think that there's, uh, uh, there's room to grow for, uh, for the side that is not uh, supported by AT&T? Or should they not even bother about really spending too much marketing money and getting people that are not on that plan yet, uh, uh, as they have such great figures in, on conversions uh, right now? Well, it's not so much that I think they, they shouldn't focus on people that aren't on at and I think their main focus should be partnerships. Right. Because I think with, it's similar to Spotify. You know, the main growth channel is, is partnerships. <laughs> in going through an existing user base that already has the device or, or whatever that you need in order to use the service and just pre-installing it or, or, or giving it away to those people. Yeah. Because, it, you know, at least according to this article, they need 5 million people to, uh, 5 million paying people to, to be profitable, which, I mean, if the history of the music industry is anything to go by, <laughs> by the time they get to five, it'll probably be 50. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, if they do need 5 million, then they then actually directly signing up those people, I think, is actually the, the, the worst thing they could focus on. It is yeah. going through everything from celebrity endorsements, which are effectively like brands with millions of, of, of followers, to, to you know, uh, uh, guys like AT&T and eventually Verizon operators uh, and, and everyone else. And Beats itself, which, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's odd that they, are, they aren't giving it away with, with, uh, with the Beats headphones. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it, th th that should be their strategy, right? Because they need yeah. to, even with a 70% conversion rate, and I assume that'll drop, but let's say it drops to a 30% conversion rate. And that's, that's a lot of people they need to get to uh, unless they want to keep raising money. Yeah, and uh, I think that conversion rate is so high also because I've been told that the... Uh, 
the free trial becomes a paid s- subscription without much of a in the way of notification. It's just a <laughs> uh, okay. added added to your f- a mobile. That bill. doesn't hurt. Uh, yeah. yeah, added to your mobile bill, which is uh, substantial anyway in the states. So uh, I guess some people might not even notice that it's there. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I want to hear more about that uh, as the three-month trials uh, start uh, coming to an end and the family plans kick in. That's going to be, uh, I think, the most interesting part of the play too. Uh, and uh, uh, going from, uh, uh, you know, you're talking about you can't judge a service from the first month of existence, and that was certainly true from of uh, Twitter music because uh, uh, if you judge by the first month, uh, probably you would have <laughs> thought, you know, it would have been like a relatively successful uh, little app there but uh, uh, Twitter announced this week that they would uh, stop uh, uh, so would stop it working from April the 18th and actually remove the app altogether from the uh, app store so uh, no one was surprised really uh, particularly uh, considering the performance of the app uh, I do wonder if uh, long term this is having or has had an impact in other large networks approaches towards music like for example Facebook uh, uh, Sitar do you think that might be the case and that people might be a little bit more circumspect when trying to come in bullish uh, in a field like music that is actually really hard to crack. I don't know. People seem to keep coming in very bullish in the music industry, which I don't. I don't really understand why. I think. I think it's part of the bravado of the music industry is that you have to come in big, or you just don't come in. Yeah. Uh, I actually never even downloaded the Twitter Music app. I just never really saw or two or or why I would. I. Like the problem for me is not <clears throat> finding new music. There's lots of new music out there and there's lots of ways to find it. It's more finding it in a way that's sort of passive for me. Yeah. I, I, so, so for me, it, it just, and I think it's actually far more people have this problem than, than, than realize. And so I just, mm. to, for me, it didn't really solve a problem for me. And I didn't really understand why there was another music app that yeah. I should be downloading and, and, and using. Uh, I, so I, 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 I guess that there was a lot of, push behind it but i don't know that you know it's not like twitter is going to do something quietly yeah right like it's, it's just that that's just not going to happen right uh they pushed it heavily by having celebrities and stuff involved but in in, in general i think whenever a very large company launched i mean i mean amazon launched you know this big streaming service and and mm. again there was a big push behind it and it's just because when very large companies do things there's always a lot of buzz about it yeah uh but i always kind of evaluate stuff on on the product itself and whether sure. the product is, is, is interesting. And with Twitter, just the description of it was so boring that I, I, I just <laughs> never really saw a reason to, 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 to use it. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. And uh, another third party, you know, software is not exactly what people need. Uh, this actually, Matt, this actually leads well into the next uh, story, which was about Spotify. So Spotify has uh, announced that it will stop accepting new submissions for the desktop client's app store, uh, signaling that the days of third-party apps are, are, are counted at this point. I would imagine that uh, if they stop accept, accepting submissions, uh, the next uh, overhaul of the client might even see uh, the, the disappearance of those apps altogether. So, uh, you know, this again puts the spotlight onto Spotify Spotify's API and the integration of that API into third-party apps that are act- acting as, as middlemen uh, towards discovery. But as we've seen in the Twitter music case, uh, that's not an easy thing to do because people uh, are, you know, it's hard to convince people to use a third-party app uh, uh, and signing it through Spotify when it's so much more convenient to just use a Spotify app. You know, do you think that the, this is going to hurt uh, some of those companies at all? Or do you feel like consumers are savvy enough now to be quite happy using a third-party app through Spotify and listening to full tracks that way? Sure. I mean, I can speak to this directly because this is my jam has a has a Spotify app. Of course. Um, but uh, actually, in fact, for some time now, we've actually been talking to Spotify about, hey, a lot of things that currently are happening locked inside our app, which only works in your desktop client, doesn't work in your web client or yeah. the mobile clients. Um, you know, could we do some of that on this is my jam directly? We, you know, a lot of users were saying, why can't I just connect, you know, my jam, my Spotify account on the website and then things can happen. And then, um, in fact, last FM actually just did a nice Spotify integration, yeah. uh, purely on the website, but you can actually play directly on Spotify from last FM. Yeah. Um, so I actually think if Spotify makes good on their promise to do a wide release of the APIs necessary to do that kind of thing across both web and mobile, um, I actually do think that their platform as a whole or the Spotify ecosystem will be in better shape yeah. than, it, than it was when they were acting as gatekeepers and having to operate this little app store and how do you root users through that. There were a lot of obvious problems there. Yeah, and there was frustration um, as well because not all apps got approved. So, 
Exactly. And their approval process, I can speak from experience, was, was Apple levels of uh, detail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think there's an opportunity there for Spotify. I think there's still no you know, paid-for streaming service with a free tier that could claim to be the kind of plumbing for the musical internet. Yeah. Um, you know, in some areas, it's SoundCloud. Um, Spotify does have widgets right now, but they're relatively limited in functionality. Um, there's YouTube, of course, but that may be changing as well. So I, I do think there's an opportunity there if they do make good on the second half of this news, which is we're going to have a bunch of new great APIs for developers to work with. Yeah. Um, I think it could be a good move. Yeah, and Sitar, from from your perspective as a, a you know a potential investor, you know, do you think that having becoming a platform rather than a service makes more sense for Spotify and become pervasive to to the web, a, a bit like SoundCloud has done, uh, makes more sense for them? Yeah, I mean, I, I I definitely think it's 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 interesting. I mean, from my own view, I think Spotify. So I'm not a Spotify investor. Sure. Uh, uh, and I guess I, yeah, I am still a SoundCloud investor, and so I, I'm not entirely objective on this. Yeah. Uh, but that said, uh, I'd say as a consumer and a user of Spotify, I have wanted an upgrade to the product for a very long time. Yeah. Like I, I can safely say that that since I downloaded the mobile app to now, there's been very little change to the product, and it's getting to the point where it feels like a broken experience to me. Right. So from a user experience, I, I like a lot of the stuff that's on, like uh, what. Matt was saying, like for, for, from from using it, a lot of the stuff that's on the desktop client isn't in, in mobile, yeah. and I'd really like it to be right. Like I, I I don't really like to do the seek and find on Spotify where you put in an artist and then you find it because I oftentimes don't know what I want to listen to. Yeah, and I think the apps are a great way of layering on top of all of the content they have. I think there's even potential for them to add a business around that. Yeah. Uh, but they need to to do some serious product development on that, uh, both on the API level, but also I think on the mobile client itself from a user experience level. And so I, I, I hope this means they're going to be focusing a lot more on the product than they have, uh, you know, past couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Now it's, it's going to be a, a, a very fun uh, space to see develop, and uh, uh, they might even open the API for up to for for uh, free users of of a service uh, to some extent. So that that could be a, a very big uh, uh, opening of the API if they did that, because uh, it would allow so many more people to actually uh, use those apps uh, as free customers uh, of the service. Although you know, then there's a whole. Uh, question mark around conversions and you know the fact that having that premium layer allows for a, a lot higher uh, number of conversions uh, for people that open up the app and realize they can't really use Spotify on them <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah it's gonna be interesting to see how they how they balance those two and uh, uh, looking at uh, oh I, the other thing that came out of Spotify actually was that they uh, announced a half price uh, a discount for students which is uh, oh. interesting uh, in the US I think at least I'm not sure if it's uh, available in the UK I think it's US mm -hmm. only for now but you have to provide the proof of being student Student, and then you get a Spotify subscription for four dollars ninety nine a month, which is a neat little discount for uh, students that uh, uh, can't afford uh, to pay the full rate. Uh, so yeah, that's cool. There's not much comment on that. It's just a, a, a neat way of pulling people in and, and keeping them sweet. You know, like many newspapers do. There's a lot of places that do student discounts just to create brand loyalty and then retain them after they stop being students so mm -hmm. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense <laughs> and uh, and finally I want to talk about Linkin Park uh, as sort of like a, a extra thing that you know uh, has happened in in the music tech space uh, and uh, we haven't seen much in the in the way of uh, bands going all out on, on game development for a while and so uh, Linkin Park showcased uh, a six minute video uh, of the band's latest single Guilty All the Same and the video uh, is uh, of a game they developed alongside uh, Microsoft's uh, project Spark. So the project uh, allows, it's like a modular uh, way of building games in, in a simplified way, I guess. It, it makes it a little bit more simple to develop your own game on the Microsoft Spark, Project Spark uh, platform. Uh, at the moment, uh, they are only available on Xbox One and Windows uh, 8.1. But essentially what it does, it allows users to have this experience uh, uh, on a game level with a song, and it also allows them to remix parts of the song. So it's a, it's a dual approach, both uh, in a gaming sort of adventure style uh, context and in a music remixing uh, side of things. So uh, you know, Linkin Park always, you know, they often do interesting things on the tech side. It feels like they're really interested in that. Uh, they 
uh, they saw the, the demo for the Project Spark at E3 from, from what uh, uh, the frontman uh, said and uh, got excited about it and wanted to, to get it included in their next release. So, uh, uh, Matt, do you think that uh, there is still room for bands to experiment with this kind of thing or are the budgets shrinking so much that uh, uh, <laughs> it's becoming <laughs> almost impossible for even big big name acts to uh, do this kind of stuff uh, unless there is a brand involved i mean i guess in this case microsoft is probably footing some of the bill for the game, but <laughs> yeah that doesn't hurt um yeah i mean budgets are shrinking but also the cost of i mean the cost of making your own game as a band 10 years ago would have been completely exorbitant so yeah. uh, luckily costs are you know declining almost as quickly um, yeah I mean I think it's really cool when I was you know reading up on on this latest thing with Lincoln Park um, besides being very surprised that two of the members of Lincoln Park met in art school I didn't see that coming. Uh, <laughs> <Me neither. laughs> um, uh, you know things like this I think are just great ways to connect with fans to reconnect with fans and maybe haven't checked you out in a while um, and there is, you know, because of some of the dynamics of the industry that Sitar described quite accurately recently, I think there's always a risk when a band does something like this to sort of try to see it as some new model for something or, you know, oh, the future of music videos is games. And, yeah. and you know, I don't really think it's that. I think it's them being artists, you know, in the world that we live in, uh, seeing an opportunity, seeing something interesting and thinking, hey, we can, you know, fuse what we do with this and, and probably you know, get a few of our fans excited about our next tour or our next album or our next single, you know, as a result. And I think that's totally awesome. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think we're just going to naturally see more of this sort of whether or not the music industry notices or not. Yeah. And if it's a demographic as well, so it makes total sense. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Sitar, do you think that uh, uh, this again is a one-off? Uh, uh, you know, do you feel like, it, as Matt said, the development, development costs have come down enough for musicians to start being able to be more experimental with what they do on the tech front uh, around the release uh, or not? Yeah, no, I, I think musicians have been more experimental with what they do on the tech front. Yeah. I think that probably the best example of that was Bjork's iPad app yeah. uh, around the launch, which was pretty amazing, right? I mean, that... Although was on the money front, quite, I'm not quite sure about that. <laughs> yeah, I was say, that was probably quite expensive. And that's like, you know, she's as much an artist as she is a, a, a musician. So, yeah. so, you know, I think she had other reasons for doing it. Uh, but I know that also, actually, when... Uh, Eric from SoundCloud launched his second album, which was a couple of years ago. Mm. He also did an uh, iPad app, and he didn't put a lot of money behind it. Right. So that was just something he chose to do. And I think, you know, the, the, it, it, it depends, right? I mean, musicians uh, have different personalities. Not all of them want to be, or at least most are hopefully, artistic. So if you view it as something, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're creating something that's a piece of art, then I think it's good, and, and, and you can do it if it's, you know, it's another marketing channel. Yeah. Uh, but I think, yeah, you'll probably see more of it. It'll probably be less interesting. Um, and it's not going to be for everyone, right? Because not every musician, I mean, most musicians, I think, just want to make music. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, they sure. don't really want to be marketers. And it'll probably be something that's more taken over by the labels as another marketing channel. And you know, if you look at what's happened with a lot of music releases and getting them into TV shows and commercials and video games, Increasingly, I mean, it is another channel to access fans and, yeah. and to uh, and, and and to get people to discover music, which I guess Shazam plays a good role in. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I've seen the evolution of the. Uh, I've seen an article on, on the uh, latest iteration of the Imogen Heap uh, music glove, and it looks really mm. cool. So I wonder if that's going to be made into an actual product or if it's going to remain a, a one-off thing. But I think that they do want to productize it somehow. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that works. Uh, mm. <laughs> It feels like there's a lot of innovation happening in the hardware space for music these days, and uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening with uh, uh, devices and hand controls, wireless uh, gesture-based uh, instruments. Uh, uh, definitely want to see more of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. Totally. <laughs> Very excited. And uh, uh, finally, I just wanted to, uh, I think I've covered everything. Let me just check that. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to sort of go through what's happening with you guys. Uh, so for, first of all, uh, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening at uh, This Is My Jam? Sure. So um, my co-founder Hannah and I are basically working on a really new, exciting version of Jam um, that hopefully the first sort of uh, couple main features coming out of it uh, should be released soon. 
Um, and essentially, over the past two years at Jam, we've been asking our users uh, around once a week to say, right now, my favorite song in the whole world is this one. Yeah. And they tell us a bit about it, and they sometimes upload an image. Um, and it's it was meant to be slow music sharing. It was a bit more deliberate, uh, you know, really good signal-to-noise ratio, only the good stuff, you know, all hits, no filler. Um, and just by sort of codifying that simple behavior, um, we have spent the last two years, um, at first without even realizing, it, building up this incredible um, database of of the best songs of all time. So sure. people have said, this song is my jam nearly two million times now, which is, you know, small change in internet numbers. But when you consider that every single one of those was handpicked, carefully thought about, and posted, um, it's really valuable. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're melting those two million jams down. It works out to just under half a million songs. Cool. Um, and we are soon going to start exposing uh, information on all those songs and also the connections between those songs and between the people who have posted them. Um, we're calling that the song graph. Nice. Um, and yeah, we think it's going to be something pretty unique online. There's nothing quite like it. Um, and so yeah, watch in the next month or two for the first, uh, first pieces of that to be shipping. That sounds awesome. And uh, hopefully we'll manage to do a, a piece on the show just on that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that'd be great. Sounds great. And, and so Sitara, on your front, uh, can you, uh, do you have a, any startups you've invested in that you want to talk about? Uh, even if it's not music related, uh, you know, totally happy. <laughs> yeah, although I'm conscious of then it becomes like advertising more than anything else. Oh, I mean, no. we love all, all, all of our investments are awesome. Uh, but in terms of... Actually, I don't know what I'm looking for, I guess, in terms of, of new investments. So in music, I, I have probably become increasingly uh, frustrated with, with, with labels and anything that has to do with recorded music. Yeah. So I, I look for businesses that aren't trying to... And anything that starts off with labels have a problem we can fix, it's almost like mm. an immediate no. Yeah. Or anything that's like, you know, consumers want to pay for music, they just don't know how. Again, it's like an immediate no. So I look for more stuff that's around the music experience. Yeah. So anything, music creation is a really interesting area, uh, which, you know, I mean, if you look at recorded music, it's an interesting industry. If you look at musical instruments, it's actually a massive industry, yeah. uh, and that's annual. So, so that's a really interesting area for me. Anything that's around the experience of music, so live music, uh, trying to make it kind of easier for people to get to shows or, or, or you know, experience music from their favorite bands in a different way. Uh, anything around that I really like. Yeah, uh, I see a lot in ticketing right now, which is interesting because I would have thought like there wouldn't be that much left in ticketing. But actually, there's a lot of software stuff happening in ticketing, which I find interesting. So it's, you know, there's like, all these mi middlemen and brokers in ticketing. Uh, and it's it's not a great experience for, for anyone really other than, I guess, the brokers. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know, I've seen a couple of projects now, which is software that allows a venue to just sell tickets directly. Which you think about before when you went to book in airline ticket and you had to go to a travel agent versus just going to the the airline's website and booking tickets. I don't know if yeah. people listening to this will even remember. There was a time when you went to like American <laughs> Airlines and it was just a you know corporate website. You couldn't do anything on the website. And there's a company that makes software that enables all of these airlines to sell tickets. Yeah. Which I didn't know. It's like a billion dollar company and they just have software that allows you to sell tickets. Wow. And I don't know why something like that doesn't exist in events or in concerts. Yeah. So something like that is really interesting. But anything that sort of kind of, I think, uh, is around the infrastructure of music or the creation of music or the offline experience of music is, is very interesting. If it's actually in you know, I, I have a service that'll stream digital music. It's, it's just not, not that interesting. Cause I think, yeah. you know, it's, it's become increasingly apparent over the years that just the recorded music industry is so, so difficult to work with that, uh, it's really hard to build a big business, yeah. uh, doing that. Absolutely. No, you're right. And uh, uh, I had actually Ashley uh, Elson from uh, Palm Sounds on, on the show last week, and uh, he talked about how incredibly huge a music message is, was. Uh, uh, he, he just uh, came back from that, uh, like hundreds of millions of dollars worth of industry uh, that we don't necessarily think about too much because, you know, we just mm. give it as granted. You know, of course, you know, <laughs> hardware devices for music, yeah, but it's, uh, it's actually big bucks. So. <laughs> it's really big. And it's annual, right? It just keeps yeah. going. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, can, you can do of hardware release every, every year and the updates and uh, yeah mm -hmm. it's uh, <laughs> it's definitely <laughs> a good place to invest uh well that's that's it i'm uh, from my end i just came back from miami from the miami music summit uh if you want to check out uh, uh what happened there if you go on mms.co 
uh, there's actually a live stream that uh, was recorded that is still available for consumption. It's, it's a bit long, it's a few hours long. Hopefully they're gonna segmentize it into, into different sessions in the next uh, few days. Uh, it was a, an awesome time and I never thought Miami was so interesting. So and I've never been there before. So it's kind of like, wow, there's a tech scene and there's yeah, all this stuff happening, it's amazing. Uh, so yeah, uh, super exciting. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And uh, uh, I'm gonna add, like I did in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, I'm gonna add a couple of interviews uh, to this show uh, towards the end. I'm definitely gonna add uh, one, the one with uh, uh, Kjartan Schletter, the head of strategy at the WIMP, who had some really interesting uh, stuff about streaming and the future of, of streaming also when it comes to um, re revenues or repartition and, and that kind of thing and I'm just looking at my list now and deciding who I want to have <laughs> and I think I'm gonna add the interview with uh, Julian Mittelberg the CEO at Bands in Town as well after the show so if you stick around it's not gonna end as usual I'm gonna have a couple of interviews right after recording at recorded at South by Southwest a couple of weeks ago well Sitar and uh, Matt it was a pleasure having you on thanks so much my question Hello everyone and welcome to the Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014. It's the last day. I'm here with uh, uh, Kjartan Schletta uh, from uh, the company WIMP. So hi Kjartan, I hope I did uh, your name, surname justice. Close, <laughs> close enough. Close enough. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And so uh, we're going to talk about WIMP. I haven't had a feature on the company in uh, probably like a good two and a half, almost three years now. So it's, it's, due. it's definitely overdue, uh, yeah. uh, freshen up. So uh, please, uh, first of all, give me, uh, give us uh, an, an outline of what WIMP is for maybe uh, US listeners of uh, listeners from territories where you're not present yet. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a streaming service. Um, that's a well-known category by now, of course. Uh, so I will try to focus more on how we are unique from the other services. Because you, ha you have the 23, 25 million songs, you have the offline, but that is all. Uh, every service has that now. So um, what we're focusing on is great editorial. So we have local editorial teams in every country. So if you open the clients in Norway versus Sweden versus Germany, it's different content-wise. Um, we're currently live in five countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Germany and Poland, and of course looking to, uh, to grow. Um, compared to other streaming services, we are stock listed. Yeah. Uh, meaning that we have a different growth strategy than the more VC funded companies. We sure. have to have a more uh, sensible growth. So we don't grow at the same speed, but we we use a lot of time to, to understand the market and build up strong local editorial. Sure. So that's one thing. Uh, uh, other thing is we just launched video, music videos. Oh, great. That's the first service. Uh, we're launching, I have already uh, launched uh, in beta magazine integration. So you can actually read, listen and watch in the client. And we, um, Octo in October last year, launched a high fee tier offering lossless streaming at double the price, which has been wow. uh, hugely successful uh, uh, for us. Um, so there's a lot of ground to cover. So uh, first of all, let's, yeah, yeah. let's talk at the international side of things. Uh, uh, so uh, you are now live in, in, in several countries. Uh, and uh, so what has, has been your approach there? So you were talking about the fact that you're, you're, you're not VC funded and so you have, to, uh, you have to have a different growth strategy. In that sense, uh, you don't have a freemium offering or do you? And how, how does that work? Uh, no, we currently don't uh, run with a freemium. We have yeah. tested it. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a freemium offering live in Denmark, Sweden uh, and Germany uh, and found that for our type of service and our type of customers that didn't really uh, work for us. Right. So we have now fo focused more on the uh, premium plus position, offering actually higher price tiers than lower. Yeah. Um, that said, we are uh, about to launch a couple of initiatives in the marketplace that are aiming at uh, like the, the low threshold users. But the traditional freemium model with stream as much as you want for uh, forever, for nothing, uh, that is not the route we're going down. No. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, looking at uh, the premium side of things, uh, how do you acquire customers uh, primarily? Do you have a particular strategy on that front? Of course, and, and uh, as I said, the streaming category is now well established. In Norway, 78% of uh, recorded music sales are now digital, So, uh, and streaming is most of that. So this is a, a well, well established category. So we don't have to, at least in our core territories, don't have to educate the users anymore. They know the service, they know the category. So now we're focusing more on how do we position ourselves compared to the competition? And uh, we do that with uh, the bullets I mentioned before. Yeah. Uh, trying to be 
a more premium service than the others. So uh, we're, we're trying to, and we've always done this, trying to take what you loved with a physical record store yeah. and bring that into the cloud. So it's not an empty algorithm kind of uh, uh, impersonal. It's, it's, there's pe you, it's people meeting people talking about music. So when it comes to looking at, uh, for example, carrier partnerships or integrations on uh, home devices, uh, uh, what is your stance uh, and uh, have you got any deals? On any I, I, as I said, uh, that's part of the hygiene factor. So yeah. all devices, and especially with Hi-Fi, uh, the lost list here, you have to be on the Sonos, uh, the Blue Sounds, and the, the, uh, the NADs, every device, and now cars soon. Um, and of course, all uh, mobile devices. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah sure. And so, uh, looking at uh, where you're seeing consumers uh, uh, utilize uh, the service the most, uh, so is it always mobile devices? And if so, do you have your own app? Uh, uh, how, how does the service work on a, a mobile? Yeah, um, and I, I would imagine this is true for all services as well. Uh, if I should be very, very black and white or uh, tabloid. Um, Usage is all mobile, and a lot of the usage which is mobile is offline. So uh, that's by far the most important uh, device uh, or device type for us. Desktop is still uh, important as part of the mix, uh, but it's not. What we, that's not where we see uh, conversion being driven from. So it's it's a need to have but not the end destination for the users. And we see uh, the more devices uh, the user have uh, connected to his WIMP account, the longer he stays in the service, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. I've seen a, a couple of reports recently talking about how, uh, especially in Norway and uh, in Denmark, they've seen a, a slight decline in the uh, usage of local catalog uh, as opposed to international ones. So yeah. uh, what are you doing on that front? Are you, are you working to help local artists to get Yeah, uh, and uh, that's true. Uh, especially so in Norway, yeah. uh, the latest figures points to between 12 and 15 percent, wow. which is dramatic. Uh, in the heydays of physical, it was 50. We can never get back to that because then you control the whole ecosystem. But 12 to 15 is too low. Yeah. That said, that's the average for a, for a country. Our market share is between 35 and 45. So in in uh, uh, on, on local, so on our WIMP high fi tier, it's it's close to 50 percent actually. So we perform better. Uh, than the competition, and that's because we are a local service, right? Yeah. But uh, it's still a problem for the market as a whole. 12 to, 12 to 15 is too low. So what we actually presented here at uh, South by Southwest yesterday in a panel uh, uh, via a research partner uh, called the Clouds and Concerts we work with is an alternative way to settle in streaming. So currently the, 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 uh, the settlement model is you take all money, divide it on all streams, and then you get a market share. And we uh, have been discussing now, and what we're discussing last uh, afternoon here in, in South by, what if we settled each user individually? Right. Uh, and that has some interesting effects. One of them is that uh, local market share increases by 13%. Yeah, and of course, I actually spoke to, it was Oleg that was driving, I can't remember the name of the researcher that was driving. Arch. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, they were driving their initiative. I'm going to catch up with them hopefully soon. Uh, yeah, you should because they're doing some very interesting research within streaming. It's not our research, but we have uh, made the data available and we think it's important to be a part of the discussion because yeah. uh, streaming is such an advanced uh, uh, category now in the Nordics. So we have to be able to drive it f further. And I yeah. think this is an interesting discussion. How do we settle? Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, looking at uh, music videos, so how have you introduced them as part of your service? We've seen, you know, for, for example, what was it? Um, uh, I think it was uh, Xbox Music that recently introduced videos as part of the Xbox, uh, Xbox Correct. Live experience. Correct. Is it a similar take? Yeah, uh, and I would say that all services, um, if not this year, very, very soon will have videos. So it's, it's, it's going to be a hygiene factor. That's awesome. What we're doing with videos uh, currently, we have introduced an Android client, uh, which is a more curated uh, experience, editorial yep. experience. Uh, over the summer, we will deeply integrate videos in all of our, uh, all of our clients. And, and that means that uh, you, as a user, if it's a video track or audio track, you won't really notice. Uh, there will 
perform in the same way, but of course you have the added uh, effect of being able of to visuals. watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you could imagine a playlist where you have both audio and video tracks intertwined, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've been talking to a lot of services this week, and uh, all of them are looking at uh, dashboard integration. So are you, are you working with any car manufacturers right now to see how uh, WIMP can be integrated in the dashboard? You mean cars? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, we have the discussions with all of the big players, and. Uh, I would say that especially our uh, hi-fi tier is very interesting for them because that's a service they can't get anywhere else, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we have uh, 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 we have more requests than we can handle, actually. So yeah. it's uh, very exciting. I think that's exciting times. I think that's one of the most dominant uh, trends this year is, yeah. is the total integration in all of our devices. Like, every, every device is going online soon. And music will be a part of that. Yeah. Perhaps not in your refrigerator, but in your car, in your home stereo, and so forth. Uh, for sure. Maybe, maybe even in our refrigerator. Who knows? Who Perhaps. Knows? <laughs> I've seen a. What well, did I saw a connected uh, slow cooker? This, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're, that was, uh, we're launching Wimp Hi-Fi on that <laughs> next year. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And so, uh, looking at uh, you know uh, the company is uh, is uh, evolving. Uh, uh, or, uh, you know, organically in the sense that you know you're trying to be sustainable in the yes. way that you're, that you're evolving. Yes. So, uh, when you approach uh, the possibility of international expansion and looking at a new territory, what are the characteristics you're looking for in a new territory to say, okay, well, yeah, I think we should expand there? It's the usual metrics: population, uh, disposable income, broadband penetration, uh, uh, smartphone penetration, and so forth. But we also try to look at uh, the maturity of the market. Uh, uh, we are, for instance, in Germany, and you could argue that it's too early to be in Germany because it's a very, very, very immature market. And our service is more of an advanced premium plus service. Yeah. So we also we also tend to look f uh, towards markets where streaming or other streaming uh, players are already there and have taken the cost of educating the market because we bring something different and can live next to the other services. Like Deezer and Spotify will probably kill one of them will kill the other because they're doing the exact same thing. Uh, we're trying to uh, to live uh, next to them and, yeah. and offer something different. So you were talking about curation. So how do you deal with the curation problem? Uh, we've been hearing a lot about this. Yeah, here it's at one of the topics for this year, right? Yeah. We, we, we deal with it with humans. So uh, we have algorithms uh, working, of course, uh, behind the scenes. But every, uh, uh, every um, uh, piece of content or piece of music uh, that is presented to the user via the clients is picked by someone. Yeah. Um, so that's the route we're going. It's kind of expensive. Uh, you have to hire a lot of uh, skilled people. Uh, it's kind of slow because you can't grow. In that, you, you, we, we couldn't launch in 100 countries, right? Because yeah. we need to be um, uh, tailored to each one. Um, but that also means that you can, you can go to each individual label that is relevant in that country and make deals and make sure that you have all the local catalog as well. Yes, yes. And, and we're seeing some launches that have been, yeah, we launched in 100 countries. Uh, but it's not actually launched. You can access it and you can go to the website, but uh, the, the content is not tailored to the country. Um, and the editorial is not tailored to the country. So. Um, we have chosen a different route. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, when you do go uh, to a new country and start speaking to labels, uh, is there quite a lot of education that needs to be done around, uh, uh, you know, what you, who you are and what you're doing? Not anymore. No, no. We are. Uh, Wimp Music is is one of the top ten players globally. So we are on all the. Uh, we, we are being discussed in all the meetings at, at the label side. So they know us very very well. Yeah. And and the fact is that most of the negotiations are not with a single country, but from the central hub, London or, or New York. So uh, I, I would say that the, the music labels or the music industry has come a long way in making it easier to grow. Uh, so that's not longer an obstacle. Rights management, however, is that's a, a problem. pain in the ass. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and we've seen, uh, I had a chat yesterday uh, about the fact that the Global Repertoire Database uh, project uh, is having a bit of a difficult time right now. I'm so. not surprised. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, apparently nobody wants to pick up the tab. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's a nightmare. And uh, the, um, what the European Union tried to do has, has actually just made it more complex since they're yeah. now competing with uh, each other. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. So that, that is and that, that is an interesting topic, and I and uh, but I don't have the solution, and I think no one has. Uh, yeah. But I think <laughs> that complexity um, hinders innovation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we're seeing a lot of different approaches here in the US. You know, there's a lot of different uh, points of view as to how things should should work. Uh, uh, on, on the product side, so sorry, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, mobile. So do you have your your own proprietary apps on mobile as well? Yeah. Uh, Android, w w yeah, yeah. Uh, iOS, uh, Windows. Yeah. Yes, as stated, hygiene factor. Yeah. yeah. And uh, on the radio side, a lot of c c companies that are working in streaming are uh, producing uh, 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 radio channels so people can listen to an endless stream of music. Yeah, session. we do that as well. You do that yeah, as well, and so. that's typically where the algorithms come in. So Great. you can start from uh, a playlist or a track or an album and you can create a radio station out of that. Uh, yeah. And that will be very interesting to see with videos because I, I think with music videos, there's a huge untapped market in presenting them in an editorial uh, manner. Yeah. So, um, uh, the best uh, videos from a certain director, for instance. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to dive into music videos and, and present that in a fresh manner to the audience, not just rows of content, but curated and, and made fun. Yeah. yeah, I mean, videos is going to be very interesting to see how that plays out in the home as well. Uh, so, do, do you have like integration with some of the, the, the boxes or uh, uh, yeah. things that are working in the I, home? Yeah, and th that's a very interesting part of the market now because we see that a lot of uh, these uh, Connect 2 devices are coming, like the Chromecast and, and, and others. And that's a very interesting domain to send videos to the big screen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so for sure, uh, everything that is connected to entertainment in the living room is high on everyone's agenda, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. And finally, you know, you, you, you are in countries where streaming penetration is almost uh, at it's, you know, at the biggest it can get. Essentially, you know, uh, you know, it feels like uh, this year certainly streaming will conquer the vast majority of the market, and at that point, there's going to be very little room for expansion. So I don't agree. I don't, don't agree. agree. No. Okay, cool. So in Norway now we have two years with total growth. Uh, uh, digital uh, market share 78 percent and streaming 65 or something um, I believe uh, there is still room for growth uh, on two accounts uh, one is of course there's a user segment that hasn't adopted streaming yet and that's the older population and uh, as this get into into more and more devices through their uh, broadband connections through their cell phone uh, 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 dealers uh, we can reach them. Uh, that's one thing. The other one uh, is price. I yeah. believe uh, that there is, I don't believe, I've seen it. There is a segment, if that's 10 or 20 or 30 percent, that's too early to conclude on. But there is a sizable segment that are willing to pay more for more. And I think that's one of the, uh, the price point was, was the correct one, 9.99 or 99 in Norway, to get mass uh, penetration. Um, but we have lost the entire uh, usage group uh, from the physical dates that used to spend thousands of kroners or hundreds of pounds each month on, on uh, CDs or vinyl because you can't pay more than 9.99 so I believe there's a huge potential to drive uh, parts of the market to a higher price tier and that's what we've done now with uh, WIMP HiFi which is double the price and there's a double digit penetration of our users already so, wow. so I, I believe in Norway we can get back to uh, the same amount of revenue as in the peak year of 99-2000, the, right. the year uh, Napster launched, and that in Norway is one uh, billion, approximately. And if we can do that, I think we have done something that no one dared to believe in yeah. just a couple of years ago. That's incredible. So yeah, essentially, the growth is not, you know, we don't have to look at the current market as the only potential market. No, we have because to look at the no, because that. the fact is that we have one price model in the marketplace, and that's, that's all we see. And if you look at the telco, they typically have a multitude of tiers uh, speaking to different usage groups. And you will see that in streaming as well. That's great. And so just uh, just uh, as a technicality for, yeah. the, for the listeners, yeah, yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, streaming rates, bit rates uh, do, do you stream at uh, with a high fi uh, uh, It's lossless. Oh, it's lossless. Great. It's lossless, yeah. So awesome. it's the uncompromised file directly from the record label. So there's nothing done with it. It's, uh, it's as, as intended by the artist. That's great. Yeah. I'm sure like the, the fact that Neil Young got launched his Pono campaign as well. Yeah. Even if it's a different service, it will definitely raise awareness. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm curious about uh, the service and the name. <laughs> That's yeah. another story. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, 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 it might have some kind of appeal uh, on a global scale, but I, I can't see it, at least the Nordics, uh, having uh, a lot of penetration because we kind of offer the same, just yeah. just uh, with 25 million tracks instead exactly. of the limited catalog. It but I think it's very interesting that it's more focused on higher quality music files. Yeah, that's absolutely. good. No, that, that's a good thing. And I yeah. think, I mean, I was the biggest skeptic of, of, of Bono uh, before they actually launched, but now I understand, you know, they're gonna, uh, you know, target a very small section of the population, people that have very high-end speakers at home and yeah. they can use them. Because, you know, at my house, I don't have any, I don't have any five grand speakers to no, actually no. listen to 192 kilohertz tracks on. So, exactly. you know, <laughs> so I, me, I, I want to uh, hear the difference. Exactly. <laughs> I welcome the initiative. Uh, I don't see it really um working yeah but uh the initiative is is welcomed definitely mm. and so looking forward to the next uh, couple of years you know what's the, what's the most the thing that's exciting you the most about uh, the growth of WEMP uh, right now uh, it's uh, if i should pick one thing it's uh, it's uh, hi-fi lossless streaming connected to the explosion in connected devices because uh, hi-fi really comes into its own uh in the living room and with the Sonos and, and, and uh, competitors, people are now increasingly having uh, expensive uh, hi-fi equipment at home. So for us, I mean, if, 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 if I can pick one thing, that will be where I see the biggest potential for growth right now, uh, both in revenues and, and in penetration. Fantastic, and uh, if people wanted to check out more about WIMP, of course, it's uh, WIMP.com. WIMPmusic.com. WIMPmusic.com, uh, perfect, and you can find everything out. They have a, a very well-maintained uh, 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 press release uh, list as well, so you can read about all the latest news that they have uh, over that's there correct. too. That's And uh, I can be contacted directly, of course. Okay, yeah. that's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, you can see behind me that they are starting to take the whole place apart, so I should probably stop recording right now. <laughs> but uh, no, thanks so much for your time, it was a pleasure. And uh, thanks for tuning into the DMT coverage of South by Southwest. It's been a pleasure covering the conference. You can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com or on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and it's a real pleasure to be here with Julian Mittelberg, the CEO of the company Bands in Town. So hi Julian, thanks for joining me. How's it going? Great, great. How about you? Uh, great, it's uh, the first day that I can actually shoot properly on the, on the balcony. I, I love this, bal this balcony, but uh, it's been rainy and then it's been cold and uh, this is the first true, day where we can uh, shoot here. Beautiful. So uh, tell me all about Bands in Town. I'm sure the majority of the audience will be familiar with the company already, but just in case, let's give a quick overview of the company. Well, uh, Bands in Town, uh, at least for fans, uh, is uh, today the largest uh, concert discovery app uh, in the world. It basically um, helps fans never miss their favorite artist uh, gigs, you know, and that's one of the big problems of the industry is a lot of people don't know that their favorite bands are coming in town yeah. and they miss their show and we're trying to solve that problem. Sure, absolutely. And so uh, when the company start out, uh, it's, it's quite a long history, right? So the company actually started yeah, about three years ago in uh, uh, San Diego uh, and uh, uh, founded by, you know, four young people. And uh, we uh, we uh, teamed up about a couple of years ago uh, with uh, our company Selfish uh, to uh, accelerate that product. Uh, it started actually originally f to be a platform for artists to help them better promote their tour dates, and then we launched a um, consumer product to help also fans never miss a show. And fast forward. You know, uh, today uh, we're about to announce that we passed 10 million concert goers using the app. Wow, that's, yeah. a, that's a lot of concerts. So that's a very, yeah, lot of concerts, a lot of people, yes. Yeah, that's great. I think we said that aggregated our, uh, our users uh, combined about a million hours of, uh, you know, concerts every week. So that's pretty big. <laughs> That's huge. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the fan-facing services first, and then we're going to delve into the artist services and, and the APIs and all that. So, uh, or, or, you know, if, if, if a user wants to use uh, uh, either the, the, the app or the company, what, what happens? Well, where do they go? So uh, what we do is uh, it's quite simple. The first thing we do is we try to know uh, the kind of music you like. You know, so we look at your, if you download the app, you look at your iTunes library, we look at your, what you listen to on Spotify or on Deezer, what you thumbs up on Pandora, uh, or what you like on Facebook, or what you follow on, on Twitter. And based on that, we have an algorithm that makes you track 
uh, uh, a number of artists. We think, you know, if you listen to a, a track for a number of time, then we think, oh, you like the artist, so we make you track this artist in Benzin Town. Once you track an artist in Benzin Town, you'll always be notified when they come to where you live. So the way it works is we have your we have your music profile. We also have the largest database of events, upcoming events in the world. We cross that. We know where you live, and when the artist just announced a show that is coming to your town, then we let you know. And we let you know via mobile notification, via Facebook app, or via email. So you are you are on all those platforms, right? Correct. Perfect. Uh, both iOS and Android. iOS, Android, Facebook app, voilà. and uh, on the web. Awesome. So, uh, talking about the band services, that you, you said that was uh, the initial focus of the company. So, uh, what have you got in store for artists on that front? So, originally, the way it started is that uh, you know artists on Facebook were doing were having difficulties to display their tour dates. They didn't know where to put the tour dates. You had a feed. Uh, they had to post something. They had to create a Facebook event, link to the right ticketing company, the event, and the venue. So, we just basically built a solution to do it automatically for them. It saved them a lot of time then we build an engine to post on their behalf so that you know if they don't remember how to post they could post we could post for them uh, geotargeting to the right people at the right time and they started to use us as a way to better display and promote tour dates on Facebook then Twitter then we built a very efficient widget that they can display on their website and so how's uh, how's the artist adoption of it and uh, what is their reaction also to having a tool that allows them to do that so uh, we've been very surprised uh, uh, when ben Benz in town joined us, uh, they had about 15,000 uh, artists. Uh, we just passed 200,000 artists using uh, this uh, part of our application. About 65% of touring artists are now using uh, Benz in town. So we have a pretty high penetration of that, That's awesome. of that industry. And, uh, and so looking at the monetization side uh, on both fronts, so uh, on the uh, fan side, is it uh, more uh, driven by uh, affiliate sales of, of tickets or what's the main draw there? So the uh, uh, today the main driver of monetization is actually to start offering promoters of shows a way to better promote their show Great. to users, uh, uh, much more than affiliation from uh, ticketing. We we do send about three million people a month buying tickets. That's a lot, but you know the revenue stream from affiliation is not that great. Now on the other hand, because we know exactly what our users like and where they live. Uh, then we tell uh, promoters you can actually have a bigger show of voice and create a dedica dedicated campaign to promote your tour yeah. to our fans. And that's becoming very popular. That's awesome. And on the artist front, do you provide any premium services uh, for them? No, we think that, uh, you know, we, we'd rather just keep it you know, free. That's free. Great. <laughs> you know, that's uh, a lot so of them. companies that are monetizing an artist on that front. So you know. I know, and I think that you know, we have so many of them now. Yes, we have you know, 50% of the top 40 artists, uh, you know, billboard artists, but we also have a long, long tail of small artists. We don't think necessarily they have the resources to uh, to pay. So we rather just you know, uh, offer that service for free. And actually, on the other hand, you know, try to monetize with people with money, promoters. Or That's brands. Great. So brands also are starting to be interested by the service. A lot of brands that are involved in, you know, uh, touring and, and sponsoring uh, would like to see more eyeballs on digital, and we think we can be offering that for them. So that's what we start to do. That's awesome. And the company uh, is uh, really uh, very much involved in the, in the big data conversation around music. And you are uh, also an early uh, you know, provider of, uh, of uh, API access to, to, to the service as well and to your data. So uh, how have you seen that space evolve over the last uh, couple of years? And uh, are, you, are you surprised by how prominent the conversations around the usage of APIs have become today? So two things you're saying, big data and API. Let's start with the API. We, we've been offering the API uh, for since the beginning. Uh, the reason why is because in our mission to make sure that artists promote, the, you know, can reach as many fans as possible, you know, we cannot do it just by ourselves. So we're offering other services a chance to also display the store dates. If you use uh, Shazam, for example, when you Shazam a song and you have a list of options including tickets, that's uh, using our API, SoundHound, Reverb Nation, a band page is using a, you know, a large uh, part of our um, uh, database as well. So sure. we're trying to offer everybody a way uh, to, uh, to promote uh, artists. Oh, um, Nokia now, all around the world, uh, when you use their music services and you have Geek Finder, this is also using uh, 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 Benzin Town. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, uh, on that front, uh, uh, how do you see that moving forward? I, I know that a lot of companies are looking at uh, other APIs as a potential uh, extra source of income. Are, are you monetizing the API right now? No. I think that for us, it's really a distribution play. It's Great. to say to the artist, you're going to be everywhere. 
And uh, to make that happen, we're going to give everybody an, an opportunity to display your tour dates. Uh, it's key to understand that we're really displaying artist tour dates. Uh, we have a big catalog of events, but we always try to have all those tour dates validated by the artists so they can be official and then distribute them. Yeah. So that's where today, that's where we're seeing it's a free API. Anybody can use it, uh, uh, and I don't think I see a, in the near future a way to monetize it. That's now great. on the big data side. Um, uh, it's a very hot subject, but we actually started with this. The only way we could really do uh, an efficient um, product for our consumers is to be able to make it to use big data to make it very simple. I like yeah. to say I use big data to make a very simple service. You receive a very targeted email or notification to tell you your artist is coming in town. To be able to do that, I have to go through all your music library many times. I have to go through all my uh, you know, uh, event catalog, filter, and then give you the results. So that's the yeah. way we actually right now using big data. Is to, big data is to provide a simple service. The second thing we're doing now is also to look at the way people behave when they go to show, when they post content, where you know reviews of the show, and try to also now go back to the artist and tell them, hey, maybe we have information that allows you to better route your tour. Yeah. You know, use it. So we're opening that to uh, touring management and, and artists for them to start to use that to better prepare the next tour. Absolutely. That's, that's great. And so uh, you were talking about uh, some interesting uh, things happening on the search side and SEO. So uh, what kind of work have you been doing lately on that front? Well, it's, it's very new. Uh, but uh, uh, last night, um, uh, Google may, made an announcement saying that uh, they were now adding uh, tour dates to their graph. And uh, the way they do it is they, uh, when they crawl a artist um, uh, uh, website and they actually uh, uh, bump into our widget that we offer all artists to place, they will consider this content as uh, the official tour dates of the artist. Great. And when you search the artist name on Google and you see the you know the Google window where they list aggregate all this uh, music information, yeah. you will see those dates also displayed. So now the artist through Benzin Down can also control the first date that are shown on uh, Google search results. That's awesome, and it's good to see Google doing, uh, taking some more steps At in last. To helping uh, yes. artists. Because yes. uh, I was a medium in a very heated session that I moderated there, uh, where Google got some slack because of, of uh, some of the things that they were doing and the fact that we're not helping musicians enough. So uh, definitely, yes. I think yes. that that puts some it's salt. About time, in. I yeah, agree. I agree. De definitely about time. And so you know, looking forward, uh, what are what are you really excited about uh, when it comes to the company and its future development? Uh, what can you see for the next 12 months? So, uh, two areas of, uh, uh, um, I think, um, improvement and innovation. On the, on the artist side, uh, we're going to do something very interesting in the next, I would say, you know, months, months and a half, is for the first time, we're going to allow artists to communicate with our users. So, right. on, on one hand, we have 200,000 artists. On the other hand, we have 10 million concert goers. The only way they communicate is when we notify users when the artist is coming in town. That's the only, ch that's the only channel. We're going to open a new channel where artists actually can communicate directly with their fans. Fantastic. For example, uh, you know, if uh, you have you know a thousand fans that are RSVP to a show, and you want to say, hey, you know, get excited, you know, in three hours I'm there, get ready, and you want only to target those people, those artists will be able to use our platform to reach them out, well, to reach out to them. So that's the first thing we're doing is opening, you know, communication channel between artists and. Uh, uh, concert goers. Yeah. On the fan side, uh, in Q2, we're going to release a new version of our mobile app, which is going to add a um, stronger uh, social layer to the app. Uh, we're adding um, some features where you're going to be able to see uh, what your friends are doing, when they're tracking an artist, when they're going to a show, the kind of photos and videos they post about a show, other friends, friends of friends, and try to artists also post and try to have a destination where we can start to aggregate everything happening in Benzin Town around one artist. Today you have to go, it's very hard to get there at yeah. one place, that's where we're going to go. It's uh, really crazy being here in the States because you talk to artists and uh, you, you really uh, get to understand the uh, hugeness of the US when it comes to the concert market because yes. uh, you know, I talk to uh, artists in the UK, and yeah, they can do a tour occasionally, but uh, it's going to be a tour of the usual, you know, 10, 15, 20 destinations. But uh, here in the US, you know, you can be on the road for a year and still not have covered Obviously. the whole country. So I guess an app like yours is really, it comes it into its own when you have these large, long tours and you have to, you know, it's impossible to manage your fans everywhere. You have to really try and, uh, and have some sort of automated process to do that for absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> You're absolutely right. So I think on, on the artist side, it's true, but also on the fan side, you know, since 
Touring is now becoming the you know the biggest revenue stream for artists. You have more and more artists touring. It's not less and less, and longer and longer. So uh, how can you help um, fans navigate? To yeah. that, uh, of course, number one is to identify who they like and tell them who's coming. We also are uh, 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 now using a very solid uh, recommendation engine. Where if you live in a smaller city, you may not yeah. have your favorite artist coming, but we still want to tell you similar artists coming that we think you're gonna like. And actually, um, in our last survey, we found something very interesting. Uh, about 20% of our users have been to a show of an artist they didn't know before, bands in town recommended them. Wow. It's very impressive. So we talk about music discovery, we're now launching concert discovery. And those are people that are spending 20, 40 bucks yeah. to see someone they didn't know before because we recommended it. So it's also a very interesting new way of, you know, going to a show. That's great. And on the other side of things, are you also looking at uh, uh, letting artists know where they should go? If, if you can if you can notice that, you know, you got like 2,000 fans in this random place that you maybe you would never think about touring. Yeah, good question. We, uh, so we have, um, we have a feature we're adding into our consumer app. It's called Play My City. So if you're a fan of an artist and you see the tour just announced and you don't see your city, you know, listing on the tour, uh, you have a function now that allows you to say, I want the artist to come to me. Awesome. And as we start to aggregate this data, we're going to share that with the artist so that the next time or even during the tour, they can even, you know, maybe add a date to a date. specific place. Perfect. And that's where big data, again, may be useful for, uh, for artists. Great. And Bands in Town is available world worldwide? So Bands in Town is worldwide. Yeah. Uh, it's only in English right now, but you know, I think by the end of the year, it will be localized. Our biggest markets are uh, US, uh, Canada, UK, uh, Australia, Germany, uh, France, and uh, Brazil, believe it or not. So it's awesome. very, very spread out. That's yes. perfect. Well, Julian, it's a real pleasure. And uh, again, it's bandsintown.com. Yes. And you can also follow the company. I'm sure it's at bandsintown, I would imagine. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you.